What's going on people? Today we're going to be theorizing how the entire plot of Attack on Titan would have changed if Irvin was chosen to inherit the Colossal Titan. In this video, we'll explain how the war against Marley would have had a completely different outcome and how those events would change the future of the island. Along the way, we'll also be expanding on certain subplots from the main show, including military police corruption, the importance of the Tiber family, and whether or not Historia will inherit a Titan. Before we get into it, don't forget to smash that sub button and drop a like if you want to see more content like this, and be sure to stick around till the very end of the video so you don't miss the biggest surprise of this whole series so far. Okay, so part 3 picks up where the last video in this series left off, with the Warhammer Titan confronting the scouts in Liberia. Given everything that's happened, it'd be pretty obvious to her that Zeke has betrayed Marley, and before anyone can react, she sends spikes directly through the Beast Titan. This would be followed up by doing the same thing to Eren as well, meaning that within just a few seconds, Lara Tiber would have used her hardening against three separate enemies. In response to this, Zeke would call out for his pure titans to defend him, and across the city they'd each start running towards his direction. At the same time, Mikasa would spring into action from the rooftops and fire a solid amount of thunder spears at the Warhammer Titan's neck. This massive explosion would send it crashing into the ground as if it was dead, giving the Aegir Bros an opening to free themselves from the spikes of hardening. I imagine Zeke would then take a minute to free Flock's pure titan which was suspended in the air from the previous video, while Captain Levi would swoop down to retrieve the helpless Reiner. Outside the internment zone, Commander Ervin would still be walking around in his colossal titan, but he'd begin to emerge as a whole fleet of airships descend from the clouds. These airships would all belong to Hizuru's army, and their arrival would be part of the wider plan to defeat Mali. Within the next 12 hours, the combined forces of Asia and Paradis are planning to force the Malians to surrender by launching coordinated attacks on their key military bases. This includes destroying the airship base in Fort Salta as well as other significant locations, and the scouts will need to split into teams for this to happen. With Ervin having seemingly destroyed Molly's chain of command in the last video, the next 12 hours is super important as it's best to strike now before Molly has any chance to reorganize itself. As the airships get closer, Ervin would then fully exit the Colossal and hitch a ride to the center of the zone where the Warhammer Titan is fighting for its life. At this point, all of Zeke's pure titans are now in the area, forcing Lara to defend herself from Peek's dad, Porco's mother, and Flock, not to mention constant thunder spear attacks from Mikasa. In a situation like this, the Warhammer would have to keep using more and more hardening to stay in the fight, which by default drains more and more energy. Now, off to the side, Porco would have manifested a new draw titan so he can try and take down Eren, but Zeke would make a move to defend his younger brother. In particular, he'd command his last remaining pure titan to attack, and if you do the math, you'll realize that this Titan here is actually Porco's own father. Earlier that night, Mr. and Mrs. Galliard were spiked at dinner with Zeke's spinal fluid, alongside Reiner's mother and Peek's dad. But with Karina being squashed in the last video, only three of the parents became Titans when Zeke eventually screamed. The Beast would try to psych Porco out by telling him this, and it wouldn't take long for the warrior to realize that this isn't a bluff, since the Titan attacking him would look exactly like his own dad. He'd then look over to see his mother fighting against the Warhammer, and this is the moment when his soul would break in two. Galliard would consider for a second whether he should just let one of his parents eat him, but while he's distracted, Levi would pounce in to chop off the Jaw Titan's legs, with Eren following this up by ripping off his arms and smashing his face into the ground. Meanwhile, the Warhammer Titan would also be getting seriously overwhelmed, and in this moment she'd have to use her last drop of energy, which is precisely what Zeke had been waiting for. His strategy from the beginning was to wear her down using his minions, and having now witnessed her final desperate attack, he'd launch a pitching assault to finish her off. The Beast would then tell his pure titans to stop fighting as he goes to examine the Warhammer's body, and after finding the trail and following it, he'd eventually find Lara's Titan Crystal. While that's happening, Commander Ervin would arrive on the rooftops to observe the situation, and he'd watch on as Zeke tosses the Warhammer Crystal to Eren. The reason he passes it to his brother is pretty simple, but in order to explain, it's best to do a brief flashback. Two years ago, when Paradise and Hizuru would have begun planning this invasion, Zeke would have helped out by sending intel about the strengths and weaknesses of each warrior. Because of this intel, the scouts have known for a while that the Jaw Titan can break anything, and with Galliard being defeated, Eren instinctively shoves the crystal inside his mouth. He then lifts Porco into the air and uses him like a nutcracker, which grinds Lara's body down to nothingness, and as Eren drinks her spinal fluid, he'd gain the powers of the Warhammer Titan. Following this, Eren starts to go off script as he begins to eat Porco as well, but the commander would shout from the sidelines telling him to stop. Months ago, it was already decided who would inherit the Jaw Titan if everything went to plan, and the person selected was Louise. To be more specific, she would have definitely volunteered herself, as she's always had that mentality that you can't do anything without power. 
Louise would likely think that by inheriting one of the nine titans, she could elevate herself to a similar level of strength and importance to Mikasa, and ultimately that would be her core motivation. As a consequence of this selection, everyone would keep shouting until Eren finally gives up, and the commander would then maneuver down to retrieve Poco's body himself. In the process, all three of the warriors have now been captured by the Survey Corps, and the plan is for the drawn armor titans to be eaten here in Liberio. When it comes to the Cart Titan, everyone will want to keep her alive for insurance purposes, because if someone gets injured on the battlefield, then her Titan can be used to bring them back to life. Anyway, Eren would then exit his Attack Titan, and I imagine that him and the other scouts would have final things they'd want to say to Ryaner before he dies. Once that's all said and done, Zeke would give Phlox Pure Titan the order to eat him, and sadly for him, there wouldn't be enough pot armor to save the warrior this time around. Everyone would be watching on as Flock chews Reiner like a piece of gum, and as a quick side note, I reckon that Erwin's first choice to get the armor Titan wouldn't have been Flock, but actually I think it would have been John. His leadership qualities would have made him one of the ideal candidates to inherit a shifter, but after speaking with Hanji about it, they realized that making this choice would probably damage their relations with Eren. Soon after, Flock would have completely finished eating Reiner, and Louise would now be preparing for her own transformation. Just like Flock, she drank a vial of Zeke's spinal fluid, and the advantage of doing it this way is that her Titan can be controlled. This means if something goes wrong, they can always improvise, as a Titan that can follow instructions is a lot more useful than one that just does what it wants. Sometime after Louise drinks the fluid, she maneuvered down to the ground and gives Zeke a signal to let him know that she's ready. The beast would then scream at the top of his lungs for the second time today, and once she's a pure Titan, he'd waste no time in ordering her to eat Porco. As she goes to take a bite out of the warrior, a large explosion suddenly happens out of nowhere in a nearby part of the internment zone. The building that exploded was the one where the cart titan was being held, and from where Evan's standing, he can clearly see the flames taking over. In response, he'd instantly send Levi and a few others to take a good look, while everyone else stays where they are to make sure nothing happens to Louise. Meanwhile, on the streets of Liberio, Commander McGath would be on the run with Peak, as the two of them are trying to find out what's going on. Having both recently escaped near-death situations, the only intel they'd know for sure right now is that Zeke has switched sides. McGath would therefore want to find answers by running in the direction of the Beast Titan's last scream, and a few minutes later they arrive in Reiner's old neighborhood. From a distance, the two of them would observe as Louise emerges from her pure Titan, and seeing this would make it fairly obvious that Marley just lost one of their shifters. I think McGath's first thought would be that Louise must have eaten the Warhammer, because across the battlefield, there'd be a bunch of hardening left behind by Lara Tiber. As Peek scans the area for any sign of Reiner on Porco, she noticed that standing next to Zeke are three familiar-looking pure titans. Their calm behavior would indicate that they've been created by the Beast Titan, and by looking at their faces, I'm pretty sure she'd wonder whether she knows these people. Peek being Peek, I'm sure it wouldn't take that long for her brain to start putting the pieces together, and she'd soon remember the wine that Zeke gave them to drink. At the same time, up on the rooftops, Commander Evan would now be eager to move on to the next phase of the invasion. His aim is for the scouts to split into their respective teams and get on the airships, because if they stay in Liberia much longer, then it'll only end up risking lives for no reason. Because he wants to wrap things up, he darks Sasha, Connie, and Jean to kill the three remaining pure titans in the area, while Peek watches on in complete shock. By now, she's fully realized what Zeke must have done to her dad, and McGath would have to hold her back as she's desperately trying to run to him. Remember, the whole reason she became a warrior in the first place was so that Mr. Finger could get medical treatment, and in doing that, she's proven that she's willing to sacrifice her own life in order for him to live. In that sense, it would be very in character for her to try and get herself eaten by him so that he can turn back into a human, but there's no way McGath would want that to happen. For a start, he'd remind Peek that her dad likely wouldn't want to survive if it meant he had to eat his only child in the process. The guilt would be way too much for any parent to handle, and Mr. Finger would also become a target for the scouts if he inherits the cart titan. For those reasons, Peek would stop to think about whether sacrificing herself is the right thing to do, but before she can decide, Jean swoops in and kills her dad instantly. Seeing this from a distance would understandably make Peek hysterical, and she'd likely just want to rush in there and get revenge, because her dad was her only family. That being said, McGath would try his best to convince her not to, and the two of them would get into a heated debate about what they need to do next. Now, in case you're wondering about Captain Levi, he would have arrived outside the burning building alongside the other scouts who were sent along. Their main priority here would be finding any survivors, with Hanji and Nal being two of the people who were supposed to be inside. At first, Levi would call out to Hanji from the street, but after not hearing any reply, the captain would 100% make the decision to go in. The flames inside would be so intense that I don't think even he'd be able to survive for long, but what he'd do is quickly sprint through the building trying to find any signs of life. 
As he enters the room where the cart titan is being held, he noticed body parts all over the floor and off to the side he'd see Hanji's broken goggles. Based off all the damage in the room, Levi assumes that something happened here that triggered a thunder spear explosion. Although right now he doesn't have time to investigate as the flames continue to get more and more intense. The captain would pick up the goggles from the floor as he makes his way out of there and on his face there'd just be a glum expression as he exits the building. As the other scouts approach him, he let them know there were no survivors and in his mind, the cart titan has to be the one responsible. One way or another, Peak managed to escape while everyone else in the room was blown to pieces, so clearly something must have happened and Levi would tell his subordinates to search the area for clues on where she might have gone. Switching back to Reiner's neighborhood, by this point the survey call would begin separating into their different teams and Eren's team arguably has the most significant job. Their mission would be to completely destroy Fort Salta, which is an airship base located in the south of the continent. The weapons found in that base are some of the most dangerous that the Marlians have to offer, so if it was flattened to the ground, then Mali surrendering becomes a lot more possible. However, because Fort Salta is so far away from Liberio, Eren's team would actually need to travel there by flying boat, which is a faster type of plane created by Hizrun. By contrast, Commander Ervin's team is meant to be travelling to the north of Mali by airship, where they plan to attack two important naval bases. Given that Zeke is part of Ervin's group, he finally exits his Beast Titan after all this time and a random scout swoops in to take him onto the aircraft. Everyone else then starts to manoeuvre onto their respective ships, except for the commander as he'd still be waiting for Levi to come back. Having waited long enough, he decides it's time to head off in the direction of the burning building himself, while the remaining scouts continue to grab rides out of the internment zone. Three of those remaining scouts would be Sasha, Connie and Jean, who would be on the rooftops trying to remember which ship they need to be on. In particular, Connie and Sasha would be slightly confused, but Jean would remind them that they need to be on the same ship as the Beast Titan. As the three of them have a brief conversation before they leave, a quick flash of lightning would appear behind them, followed by the cart titan rushing in to swallow Jean. The shifter would then rapidly jump from rooftop to rooftop with him inside his mouth, and Peak would be long gone by the time that Shasha and Connie even react. Several minutes later, the cart would arrive in a secluded area of the internment zone, where Commander McGath would already be waiting. After congratulating Peak for getting the job done, she'd release Jean from her mouth, and the general would take him into one of the empty houses nearby. This house is where the interrogation would begin and they start asking him questions about Zeke's relationship with the scouts as well as what Paradis are planning to do next. On top of that, they'd also want to know Reiner and Porco's location but Jean would stay quiet the whole time until Magath aims his gun. We've always known that Jean is someone who doesn't want to die a pointless death so you know he wouldn't want to get his head blown off in this abandoned house. With a gun being pointed directly at him, his new plan is to stall until Connie and Sasha arrive because he'd have faith that they would be able to find him. As a consequence, Jean would begin responding to Peek and the commander's questions, but he tried to confuse them by giving them a ton of vague answers that don't really go anywhere. Eventually, this would frustrate Magath to the point where he starts personally breaking the scout's bones, at which point Jean would tell them that there's no way Marley can win now that Paradis has the founding titan. This of course would be referring to the fact that they now have the founder and a titan of royal blood, but at this stage in the timeline, Peek and Magath didn't know that a titan of royal blood was required. From their point of view, Paradis already had the founding titan, so Jean's statement would be something that would definitely get their attention. While they interrogate him further to understand what he meant, Connie and Sasha would be on the streets of Liberio trying to find him. Being an experienced hunter, I think Sasha would be especially good at tracking Peak's Titan footprints and before long they'd arrive near the secluded area. As they continue their search, they suddenly hear the sound of a gunshot from one of the nearby buildings and as they head towards it, McGath and the cart titan would make their escape from the area. Upon finally reaching the house that Jean was being kept in, they'd find him lying on the floor losing a ton of blood and the nature of the injury meant there'd be nothing they could do to save him. The only way he'd be able to survive is if they turned him into a pure titan here and now, but neither of them would have any of Zeke's spinal fluid or any of the titan transformation serum. Instead, they'd keep shouting at Jean to keep his eyes open while they head back to the ship, but with his final breath, I think he'd tell them both to live comfortable lives when this is all over, which is something that he'll never get to do. Back at the burning building, Levi and Ervin would be reunited as the captain hands over Hanji's broken goggles. He tell the commander his theory that Null and Hanji were killed by the cart titan and the loss of two close friends would definitely be a shock even for someone like him. However, with the scouts about to potentially face the final stage in the war against Marley, Ervin would understand better than anyone that this isn't the right time to just stand around and grieve. Instead, I'm sure he'd thank Levi for salvaging Hanji's goggles and he'd proceed to give a motivating speech to the remaining scouts in the area. Following that, everyone would make their way onto the airships and on the ground, Peek and McGath would watch on as the ships all head in different directions. 
Over the next 12 hours, an all-out war would break out across the Malian continent, with Eren's team devastating Fort Salta. Using their titans, he and Flock would destroy every single airship at the base, while Louise would go on a wild rampage, killing tons of enemy soldiers. Given that this is her first time becoming a shifter, I think it's natural that she'd eventually start to lose control, hence why Mikasa would be here to deal with Louise and Flock in case things get out of hand. On the ground, Eren's team would also be supported by soldiers from Hizuru, who would parachute into the base after arriving in separate flying boats. Simultaneously, on the opposite side of the continent, Evan and Zeke would be travelling to their targets by airship. As always, Zeke's hidden motivation is to complete the euthanization plan, but on the surface, he's been helping Paradis to plan this invasion for the past two years. During that time, he gave them valuable intel to gain the commander's trust, and once the war is over, he believes that he'll finally be accepted onto the island and allowed to speak to Eren. Evan, on the other hand, would see things a lot differently, and I'll try to explain his thought process. Considering that the Beast Titan massacred the scouts, Evan would have zero faith that he actually wants to help them, meaning that Zeke must have a hidden motivation. While the commander wouldn't know for sure what that hidden motivation is, it doesn't take a genius to realize that it's something to do with the founding titan. Because of this, Evan would understand that Paradis has what Zeke wants, and as Yelena revealed, the warriors wouldn't be returning to the island anytime soon. What this meant is that Zeke's last remaining hope to come to the island and meet his brother is dependent on the scouts, and so Evan used that to their advantage. For the past two years, the commander forced the Beast Titan to prove his loyalty by sending them valuable intel, and this was all in the promise that he'd get to talk with his brother in the end. Zeke had to accept this proposal because he quite literally had no other option to get to Paradis, and after everything he's done, he assumes that Evan now trusts him. In reality, he'd already made plans for Zeke to be detained underground as soon as they arrive on the island, and if everything goes to plan, he'll never meet Eren again. In that way, both of these men have hidden motivations that they're hiding from each other, but on the surface they're pretending to be comrades. 19 hours after the attack in Liberio, the Malian military would have suffered their worst day in recent history, forcing Willy Tiber to think about their options. With Fort Salta being destroyed, Mali no longer has any weapons that can kill Titan Shifters, meaning they're pretty much helpless if these attacks continue. As Willy considers what they should do next, Commander McGath and Peak would arrive to discuss what's going on. Based on the information they were able to get from Jean, they now know that Zeke is a Titan of royal blood, and that together, the Jaeger Bros can activate the full potential of the founding Titan. From Mali's point of view, this means the enemy can nuke them with the rumbling at any given time, making this whole situation even worse than it already was. The smart thing to do would be for them to surrender before they get trampled, but there's a couple reasons why they'd hesitate. Reason number one is that Commander McGath would be thinking of Peak, because if Molly surrenders, then it's likely she'll have to go on the run to avoid being captured and eaten. Reason number two is that if they give up, then it probably means the return of the Eldian Empire, which is something that the entire planet has been afraid of for the last 100 years. Despite that, Peak would suggest a crazy idea that involves allowing both of those things to happen, because in the scenario that they find themselves in, it might be the only way to strike back at the enemy. After hearing the plan, Willy would have to think hard about it for a while, because if they do what she's proposing, then it means the end of Mali, at least in its current form. The upside, however, is that if this works, they'll be able to get revenge for the family they lost in Liberio, and the three of them will be known as heroes who saved the world, just like Helos. For those reasons, Willy would agree to set Peak's plan in motion, and several hours later the alliance between Hizuru and Paris would receive a communication. This communication would be an official notice of surrender from the Malian government, on the one condition that Paradis stops with their ongoing attacks. Of course, a surrender is what Evan had been hoping for the entire time, and after two years of preparation, the scouts would have managed to defeat the biggest military force on the planet. The fallout from this victory would have huge ramifications in all corners of the globe, but first, let's do a quick recap of what would happen on the island over the next few weeks and months. To start things off, all surviving scouts would come back home to a hero's welcome, but for members of the 104th cadets, the celebrations would be overshadowed by something else. Eren and Mikasa in particular would only find out about Jean's death once they arrive, and to say they'd be devastated is putting it lightly. Not only was Jean a close friend that had a huge impact on their lives, but after losing Armin a few years ago, this death would make Eren feel like a broken man. During the following days, there'd be funerals for all of the fallen soldiers, and on top of that, there'd also be big political changes too. Firstly, Eren would have now led the scouts to impossible victories in Shiganshina and in Mali itself, and so his level of popularity across the island would easily reach legendary status. Having sensed the overwhelming public opinion, Zachary would announce his intention to retire at the end of the year, with Eren being chosen as his successor. 
As Commander-in-Chief, Zachary is head of all three military branches, and so at the end of the year, that responsibility would be passed down to the Colossal Titan. The knock-on effect here is that the Scouts would also need someone to replace Ervin before the year is up, but with Hanji and John both dying in the war, two of the best potential candidates aren't even a possibility. In terms of ranking, Levi would be the next logical person to be commander, but he almost certainly wouldn't be interested, so the door would be left open for other people to make their case for it. In terms of other big changes for the island, the next inheritor of the female titan would be another big issue. For the past four years, Annie has been chilling inside her crystal, but as shown in Liberia with Lara Tiber, the scouts have a solid blueprint for breaking her out of there. Using Louise's power, they can crush Annie and feed her spinal fluid to a pure titan, but the question is, who would be worthy of eating her? This is where the politics creeps in, as the Crystal has been in military police custody ever since she was first captured. Given that the MPs have been looking after Annie this whole time, the higher-ups would feel like one of their people should be the next female titan. Doing this would drastically improve their declining image, with the average citizen perceiving the MPs as useless and corrupt, despite them technically being the most prestigious military branch. As a consequence, they'd pull some strings to have one of their soldiers selected, and the specific person they'd want to inherit the female would be Hitch. It's not that Hitch would be the best candidate for the job, but rather her story is what would improve the image of the military police. As Annie's former roommate who was betrayed, and the main person who looked after the crystal, they could easily spin this into a narrative that would gain the respect of ordinary people. Of course, Hitch herself would be reluctant to shorten her lifespan just so that MPs can look good, but the higher-ups would try to bribe her with huge financial incentives. At first, I think she would consider accepting this. However, this shady scenario would remind her of Marlow, and his crazy ambition to clean up the MPs. Seeing a real chance to try and make that dream a reality, she would agree to inherit the female titan but only under certain conditions. The condition she proposed would be the first big step towards wiping out corruption in the military police, and the leadership on the island would personally agree to make sure it happens. As a result, seven months after the victory against Marley, a ceremony would be held in which Annie's crystal is crushed by Louise and fed to Hitch's pure titan. In the process, she'd become the fifth member of the Titan Shifter unit, alongside Flock, Louise, Eren, and of course, Commander Evan. Now, in case you're wondering about Zeke, he'd currently be locked up as a prisoner in this special mountain facility. This secret facility would be far away from civilization, and the beast would have been brought here only a few hours after the war was over. It's important to remember that Levi was on the same airship as these two, and so as soon as they touched down on the island, the captain would have instantly chopped off Zeke's limbs and his tongue to stop him from transforming. From there, the beast was taken to this special prison, which was specifically made so they could restrain him away from the rest of society. Unfortunately for Zeke, being betrayed by Ervin has meant that he's not had any chances to speak with Eren about the euthanization plan, and with his time as the beast titan running out, it's not looking good. Anyway, switching over to the continent, there'd be some big changes there as well, with the Malian government now being under Hizuru's control. From the beginning, the main goal of the Azimabito was to restore their nation to its former status, and that's now become possible thanks to all the weapons, the land, and the resources they've gained from this invasion. That being said, around the world, there'd be a very mixed reaction to the news of Hizuru taking over, and I'll explain the reasoning behind this. To start things off, the reason Mali was so hated was because they used titans to invade a ton of countries, and so in that sense, a lot of people would be happy that they lost. However, as a result of Mali losing, the Island Devils now have 8 of the 9 Titans, including the Founder, making them way more dangerous than the Warriors used to be. This level of strength would cause many nations to be afraid of what Eldia is planning next, and in particular, they'd fear that what just happened to Mali could also happen to them. The combination of Eldia's Titans and Hizru's weapons is a force that can destroy any country on the planet, and so these countries would be feeling pretty tense about the situation. To help ease these tensions, the Azimabito would grant independence to several nations colonized by Mali, including on Yankapon's home country, and this would be an attempt to prove that they can be trusted. On a similar note, Eldia would sign a declaration promising never to use pure titans, but there's a reason why these promises wouldn't be enough to stop the growing hatred against them. Ever since the war ended, Willy Tiber would have been using his influence behind the scenes to manipulate public opinion. It's been established that the Tibers have strong connections to very important people, and seven months ago, Peak's theory was that these connections could be used to form an alliance against Eldia. Because Willy believed in this plan, he fled the continent after Mali surrendered, and since then he's been going from country to country warning politicians about the dangers of the rumbling. He'd explain to leaders of every nation the significance of Eldia now having the founding titan and a titan of royal blood, and people would take him seriously because of how well respected the Tiber family is. As a consequence, it wouldn't take long for anti-Eldia and anti-Hizuru propaganda to start appearing in newspapers, as this would be used to generate more fear towards the island. 
The story that would be told to the world is that the Jaeger brothers are planning to revive the old Eldian Empire and that Hizuru were helping them by giving the island weapons and technology. Eventually, all this panic would lead to the formation of a secret military alliance just like Peak predicted and in the present day, her plan to get revenge would be in the final stages. Back on the island, the military higher-ups would be holding talks about what they should do next as things wouldn't have played out the way they expected. Although their invasion of Mali was successful, Eldia itself is now perceived as the new biggest threat, making them a target for the entire world. With Zeke's time running out, they also have fewer options to defend themselves because when he dies, they'll no longer be able to do the rumbling. Of course, if Historia was to eat Zeke, then they could hold on to that rumbling power for 13 more years, but making her do this comes with certain downsides. From the beginning, Eren has been aggressively against the idea of Historia becoming a titan, and during these talks, he'd tell the commander they need to find another way. If they let her become the Beast Titan, then it would mean all their sacrifices in Liberia were for nothing, since Eldia would still be relying on the Rumbling for their survival. The whole point of their invasion against Mali was to secure a future where the Rumbling wouldn't be necessary, and so Eren would feel that in memory of everyone that died, they can't allow Historia to be Titanized. To an extent, Eren would understand where Eren is coming from with this, and a couple days later he'd invite the Queen and all members of the Titan Shifter unit for a meeting. The purpose of this meeting would be for him to reveal a certain proposal he's come up with, and this proposal is guaranteed to protect the island while potentially saving Historia's life at the same time. For a bit of context, at this stage in the timeline, the government wouldn't be interested in getting into a war with the rest of the planet, and right now, both Eldia and Hizuru would be trying to engage in peace negotiations with the enemy nations that want to kill them. For that reason, it's too soon to know for sure whether the island will need the rumbling for its future survival, and a consequence of that is that it's also too soon to know for sure whether Historia needs to inherit the Beast Titan. The problem here is that in a few months time, Zeke is going to die due to the curse of Ymir, so someone has to eat him before that happens otherwise Eldia will lose the power of his shifter. As a result, Evan would make the decision that one of the current scouts will be chosen to inherit this shifter, and whoever that person might be, when they eat Zeke, the island will no longer have a titan of royal blood. Having no Titan of Royal Blood means that Eldia will lose its potential to do the rumbling in a few months, but Irvin's secret plan will allow them to reverse that decision if they need to. To put it simply, for the rest of their lives, Flock, Hitch, and Louise will take turns acting as Historia's personal bodyguard, and at all times they'll need to have a syringe of spinal fluid. If there's ever an emergency that requires Eldia to use the rumbling, these three will need to be prepared to die for their country by allowing themselves to be eaten by the Queen's Pure Titan. In the process, Historia would become a royal-blooded titan shifter, but this would only ever happen if a path to peace becomes impossible. This solution is better than forcing Historia to become the beast just because Zeke is running out of time, and it leaves open the possibility that she can live a full life without ever needing to be titanized. Furthermore, with Ervin about to step into Zachary's role, his main focus as commander-in-chief will be improving diplomatic and economic relations with other countries so that they never have to use this nuclear option. I think at first Hitch would be too stunned to speak about this proposal, while Flock and Louise would be more likely to accept that they might have to be sacrificed. Meanwhile, Historia would begin to tell the group her thoughts on the plan, but before she can finish her sentence, a random soldier bursts in to tell them something's wrong. The soldier would go on to reveal that at this moment, their hidden facility in the mountains is under attack, with an unknown enemy raining down bullets from the airships. What the scouts wouldn't know though is that on the inside of this facility, a familiar face has taken advantage of all the chaos and managed to infiltrate the prison. Dressed up in the survey call uniform, Peak would come face to face with Zeke for the first time since he turned Mr. Finger into a pure titan. Although he wouldn't be able to speak because he has a gag in his mouth, she'd reveal to him that ever since they first met, it always felt like he was lying, but despite that, she never considered that he'd betray the warriors. The fact that after everything they've been through together, he was still willing to get Reiner, Porco, and her father all killed, it's proof to her that he's an objectively evil person who deserves everything that's about to happen. Going beyond their personal grudge, the coordinate is a power that also can't be trusted in the hands of the Jaeger brothers, and so Peek would bite her thumb to transform into the Cart Titan. In this form, she pounces forward to kill him by crunching through his spine, and she snaps off the top half of his body. As she chews into him, she technically merges the Cart Titan and the Beast Titan into one, but more importantly, by doing this she's taken away Eldia's most powerful weapon, which sets the stage for the Global Alliance to make their next move. With that said, that's the end of part 3 of What If Ervin Got The Colossal Titan, and if you liked it then I'd appreciate if you shared the video, dropped a like, and subscribe so you don't miss future videos like this. I also want to shout out all the different artists who drew things for this video, their links are in the description so be sure to check them out, especially Velupio who designed the most pieces out of anyone. 
As always, thanks for watching, and I appreciate your patience in waiting for this to come out, because it did take a, a lot longer than expected. And uh, until the next one, peace out.